Hi, today we've got some new PCBs from JLC PCB. These ones have been partially assembled by the SMT assembly service. The parts that aren't on here are the ones that weren't available or are through hole parts. So we've got to assemble those ourselves. But as some of you correctly guessed, these are for the RGB touch controllers, which I did a video on quite a long time ago now. But I really liked the design of these because they fit into a standard UK wall patris. You can just screw them in. And then you've got a really nice touch interface that has everything you need. So you can put it into RGB mode, you can change the brightness, and then there's some other modes using the mode button speed, and then you've got the uh, set it to white button as well. But I really like the design of these. And what these were was a touch panel interface on the front. And then these came with a daughter board that sat inside and that provided the three PWM outputs for RGB strips. Now, it worked okay. Obviously, it had its limitations. These controllers, I don't know why they do it, but the mode button that is some LED patterns, they're always psychedelic disco patterns rather than anything that's slightly usable in a room. They're just flashing all the different colors. So, first of all, that was the one of the problems that I didn't like about this design. The other thing is... I wanted to be able to control quite a few different types of fixtures and some of the early viewers of my channel will have seen these DMX controlled LED lights and I've got a whole bunch of these so I thought it'd be really neat if I could control a whole load of these lights with one of these interfaces. So that's what we're going to be doing in this video and probably the next one. I don't think we'll get it all done in this video but basically what I've done is I've copied the outline of the original PCB but modified the design for my own purposes. So what we've got on here is our power input. For some reason I wrote 12 volts on here, but this is actually fine all the way up 28 volts. Uh, we've got an RS-485 interface, and then we've got another RS-485 interface. And this second one is what I'm dedicating to DMX control. Now this doesn't have opto-isolators or anything like that, but given that they're controlling something that's powered on the same network, I didn't see that as a big problem, and these don't have the opto isolators in either. So we've just got standard RS-485 transceivers, all going to be using the same signal levels. So this is our DMX interface. And what I thought would be quite cool is, for example, in our bedroom, we might end up having some kind of RGB feature on the ceiling. And we could have two of these in the same room, so one either side of the bed. And it'd be quite cool if we could have master and slave control. So I was thinking we could either use this second network port to link two together so that they both operate in the same way or that this can connect to the lighting system that I was working on so that if no one's in the house for eight hours it turns it off in case we've accidentally left it turned on. So there's a whole range of features that we could use this um, interface for but primarily at the moment I just want to have the master slave control and the DMX control of these lights. We've got a fairly straightforward schematic. First of all, the power supply is based around a Texas Instruments TPS54202. This is a book converter IC that can take our 8 to 28 volt input and give us a 5 volt signal for all of the logic that's on the PCB. Then we've got a microcontroller here which is doing all of the processing. It's quite a capable device. It's the DSPIC33EV256 GM002. And the reason that I went with something like this is not because of its capabilities, but I quite like the 16-bit microcontrollers that Microchip do, but all of them run on 3.3 volts. So this is one of the few that is available in a 5-volt family. And the electronics on the front panel, so the touch controller I see, all ran at 5 volts. So I thought it'd be easiest to keep it all at the same voltage rather than having voltage level translation. And it does mean that we've got a massively overpowered microcontroller, so we could do some very complex fading routines and all kinds of stuff if we wanted to. We've got plenty of processing power there. It's not actually doing a great deal other than interfacing with two RS-485 interfaces. So we've got an SN75176 RS-485 interface here, and then we've got another one for the DMX interface. Then we've got a couple of LEDs on the PCB as well, just for status indication. And then we've got the interface to the front panel. Right, before I solder up the microcontroller, we'll just check that the power supply is working. We don't want to accidentally fry it if this is putting out the wrong voltage. So we've got an arbitrary sort of 13 volts going into the board and we should have five volts coming out. So put this on the ground and 
pin 1, pin 2, or the programming header should have 5 volts. But no, we're not getting anything there about pin 1. Nothing? No, we're not getting anything. Uh, what about on the inductor? No. No. So we've got power coming through. The polarity of that diode's correct. What about on the switcher I see? Pin 3. Yeah, so we've got power on pin 3. Let's just check we've got ground. That's on pin 1, I think. Yeah. But it's not turning on. What voltage have we got on the feedback pin? Nothing on the feedback pin, so... The book converter, for some reason, isn't powering up. So just looking at the schematic, we've got power coming into the switcher IC, and we've got a ground pin, so we should have an output on pin 2 here, which is on one side of the inductor. We saw we're getting 0 volts on the feedback pin. Um, so in the data sheet, it does say to float the enable pin. So this is the enable pin, float the enable pin to enable, which is what we're doing. Right, so we've got three volts on this probe. Let's see if we can hit pin five. And there we go. So we're getting our five volts output when we pull the enable pin high. Unfortunately, the maximum input voltage on that enable pin is seven volts, so we can't just tie it to the incoming supply. Yeah, so for some reason, this current source doesn't seem to be working properly. It's supposed to be always feeding current in and then you pull it low if you want to turn off the device. You can use the current source to set some hysteresis so you can adjust the threshold at which the device turns on and off. But for some reason this doesn't seem to be working, so I don't know if we've got a fake device on the PCB. We've got a couple of options which I've just been playing around with now that I've soldered some parts on the boards. So first of all, we're just doing a plain resistor divider. Now because the threshold is quite low, and we've got quite a wide range at which the enable pin can be used, we can actually set this with a resistor divider and still accept quite a wide input voltage range. But what I actually prefer is using an LED. And what we're doing is we've got a series resistor from the 24 volt input through to the LED and then the LED down to ground. And then we're tapping off the anode of the LED, which means that we get somewhere between sort of 2.2 volts and 3 volts fixed. Uh, there is a little bit of variance depending on how much current is going through the LED, but the variance there is much less than the resistor divider. So I quite like this option. It's a shame that we're going to have to bodge the PCBs, but overall it's not too bad and it gives us a little power LED as well. So I'm not sure what's going on with this switcher I see. Maybe it's a faulty device or a fake device, although I have used this part from LCSC before and it's worked absolutely fine. So I don't know, we've got a fix that works, I guess we'll just stick with that. But I've been doing quite a bit of work behind the scenes on the firmware for this device. So we've got a fully functioning DMX512 stack running on here. Now we can write to any position in the array and it'll update the brightness to a fixture that's addressed to that particular address. So that's all working, this is all compliant with the DMX512 protocol. What I want to try and do in this video is get the LEDs working on the front panel so if you remember from the original video, there's a one-wire interface to this IC up here which controls these three LEDs. So when you touch a button on the front, you can see we get these LEDs that light up. So there's just three LEDs there. And then obviously we want to do the touch interface, which is this little device here. And that has an I2C interface to the main chip. So what we're going to do... First of all, try and get these LEDs working. Uh, what we're going to do is probe the serial output and try and get all combinations of the LEDs and the commands that are sent to it, list them all out, and then work out how to implement that in some C code. All right, so we've got the Picoscope connected to the one-wire interface to the LED controller I see. I often get questions about the Picoscope that I'm using. It's a very low-end model. I only bought it because the Rigol computer interface is terrible. So when I try and do any screen captures, it's just really slow and it looks terrible. So the PicoScope works a lot better considering it is a PC-based oscilloscope. So I only use it for video purposes. 
So we've got no LEDs on on the front panel and we're continuously getting this code being sent out. If I press the power button, for example, we can see some different codes being sent. If I press the RGB, you can see we're getting two different codes there for when the LED is on and off. And similarly for the dim button. And what I'm going to do is just go through all the various modes and see if I can decipher all of the codes that are being shown on the screen. So these are the codes that I managed to capture on the Picoscope. There's seven in total. I'm not quite sure what they all do yet. So what we'll do is write some code on the microcontroller and then cycle through them and see what they actually do. Now all of them have the same first sequence and then it's this end bit that changes between each of them. Now rather than trying to decode what each one of these does, I think given that we only need to do seven of these at the most, I'm just going to store the timings and then we can just recreate them rather than actually trying to decode what's going on. So what we've got is first of all we've got a low pulse of 25 microseconds and then after that the only two timings that we have are 29 microseconds and 11 microseconds. So it's always following an up down sequence and the timing for the width of each pulse is either 29 microseconds or 11 microseconds and we can very easily create this pulse train on the microcontroller using one of the period match registers on the timer. So I've got a very crude diagram of what goes on. So we've got our timer variable which is increasing at a rate set by the clock speed and the prescaler and postscaler values and we have a register called the period match register and what that does is when the timer variable equals or exceeds that period match register it creates an interrupt and it automatically resets the timer back down to zero. Now you can on the fly update that period match register so for example for our first 25 microsecond pulse we can set that to 25 microseconds or whatever the equivalent is and as soon as we get the interrupt then we can go in toggle the pin in whatever mode that we want to toggle the pin and then we can update the period match register and the timer value is already still incrementing and we can update that to the new value so for example 29 microseconds when it gets there we trigger an interrupt and then we can do our 11 microseconds and so on. So just using the period match register and the interrupts we can very easily create this pulse train. Our clock rate is giving us 16.6 .6 nanoseconds per clock therefore to give us 25 microseconds we need to count to 1500, 29 microseconds we need to count to 1740 and then for 11 microseconds we need to count to 660 and overall there are 17 different transitions during that pulse train. Now there's probably a more efficient way of doing this but what I've done is I've created some arrays of all of the timing. So we've got codes 1 through to 7 and here we can see we always know that we're going to be toggling the pin and starting off at a logic high so all we need to do here is store the timing. So we've got 25 microseconds, 29, 11, 11, 29 and so on all the way to the end and then when it runs out that's our pulse train complete. And here is basically the entirety of the code. So it's all done in the interrupt. We come through, check whether we've already sent out 17 different transitions. If not, then we go through. We load the first timing into the period match register. And if the previous level was a 1, we send out a 0 on the pin and vice versa. Increment the counter and then we go through and that's that done. If we had actually sent out all 17 transitions then we turn off this timer and then we can set a flag to say that we're finished sending out the pulse train. Right so we've got the firmware flashed onto the PCB and it seems to be working properly so what I've also done is connected up a serial port to this device and if I type any number on the keyboard from 1 through to 7 it sends out those codes so code 1 through to 7 depending on which key that you press. Now this is a code 1 on the screen that you can see here and you can see that the timings seem to be absolutely spot on. So we've got our first phase here about 25 microseconds then we should have about 29 microseconds which we're seeing here 
And then finally, our other phase should be 11 microseconds or so. So the timings are working properly. And if we press some of the keys on the keyboard, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, you can see we're getting various sequences of LEDs on the front panel. So it is actually working properly. Now all I need to do is decipher what each of those codes actually does. Okay, so I've just been through them all. What it looks like is that code 1 turns off all of the LEDs, so it always turns them all off. Codes 2 and 4 appear to be the same thing, and that is to turn on the RGB LED and the little LED here to say that you've touched something on the panel. Code 3 is this LED on its own, so if any of the LED other LEDs are lit or if none are lit, all it does is clear everything and just display that one LED. If we press code 5, that's the dim LED and the touch LED. 6 is this LED on its own and 7 is the RGB LED on its own. So with that, we can get any combination of LEDs that we need on here except we can never have the DIMM and the RGB LEDs on at the same time. So that's fairly straightforward. That seems to be working quite nice. And now I have all those codes ready to go and I can send them as and when needed in the firmware. Next up, we will look at the I2C interface to that touch controller IC. So the IC that they've used is a JG916H, which has an I2C interface and 16 key touch interface. Unfortunately, the datasheet is in Chinese, but we can get a lot of the specifications we need from here without sort of trying to understand it too much. So we can see we've got our supply voltage anywhere from 2.5 to 5.5 volts. And then we've also got an indication of what's going on with all of the various interfaces that you can have on here. It tells you how to interface with the I2C, so we've got our timing diagrams. We've got an interrupt pin as well, so we don't have to keep polling it. As soon as something is pressed on the touch front panel, we get an interrupt, which then allows us to interrogate to find out what was actually happening. And then we've got all of our timing diagrams and everything like that. It tells you the format of the data, the addresses, and then we've got some details about the registers. Now, using Google, we can actually go through and translate it. It doesn't do the diagrams, obviously but we can therefore get the text from it. However, what I'm thinking is, although we need to know what the structure and everything is, what we can actually do is also use a logic analyzer to decode all of the different things on the front panel. So I've already captured all of the data and similar to the LED front panel, we don't need to decipher too much of what's going on here, especially with the initialization routine. We've got the general right to the configuration register, which just sets up the whole chip. And then we've got a whole bunch of rights to set the sensitivity for each of the touch inputs. So we just need to replicate that. And then what I've done is I've pressed the buttons in sequence. And what we can see is we've got the power button here, pressing it and releasing it. So when you press the power button, you get a 40 in this byte here. If you press the dim button, you get a 20. And there's a whole range of different values and then finally we've got the wiper which is that circle in the middle and whenever anyone presses anything on that wiper you get an 81 and then the value is in the fourth byte here so you can see one two and then depending on where you wipe it all the way up to 2a and it keeps going up further and further and then when you release it it returns back to 80. So fairly straightforward interface. I saw in the data sheet, it does have a maximum I squared C rate of 100 kilohertz. They were using 33 kilohertz on the device that was already communicating with it. So I'm gonna replicate that in my code. So I used the microchip code configurator to generate some I squared C code. I've had to modify it slightly. It didn't quite work exactly as I wanted it to, but most of the work here has been in these two files, touchic.c and .h. So first of all, we've got some definitions here. So the address of this IC is 53. And then we've got the various different codes to work out what's going on. So the second byte gives a clue as to what's going on. So it tells you which button has been pressed. The first byte says whether it was a button press or whether it was on the wiper. And then we need to decode that. 
So now we've got some initialization code. This is just sending out all of those various configuration bits to set the sensitivities for each of the buttons. We also set up the interrupts here on the device so that that interrupt pin triggers an interrupt and then we know to go and interrogate the I2C bus. And then we've got some code which actually decodes what's going on. So we've got a structure touch states and that is this structure and a union as well here which says whether it was the power button, dim button, mode and so on. If it was the dim wheel it also gives the position on the wiper as to where the finger was last pressed. And basically this should all just decode what's going on and signal that to the main routine so that we can use it to control the LEDs. Right, so amazingly the I2C code actually worked first time. There wasn't any tweaking needed, it did exactly as I needed it to. So now what we've got is some very basic features. I've not implemented everything yet. I haven't implemented the LEDs on the front panel properly. But we've got a basic RGB fader, as you can see. And then we've got brightness control of it, so we can scroll along the wheel and change the global brightness of all of the DMX settings. And then we can also go into the RGB mode and pick a colour. And we can scroll through and pick anywhere on the colour wheel. And it will smooth fade between any of those colours. So the smooth fading is handled by the DMX code that I've written here. And we're just picking a value from the wheel and feeding it into the RGB values. So that seems to be working quite nice. That's all I'm going to do for this video. Basically the hard work is done, which is deciphering how to interface with the touch panel. We've got the DMX working, so now I've got the fun task of just putting in all the various modes and all the housekeeping and getting it all working properly. So in the next video, we'll hopefully have all of this working and we'll have a really nice looking system. So thank you to JLC PCB for providing the PCBs. And also thank you to all my Patreon supporters. I always forget to thank everyone, but anyone who's donating any amount is greatly appreciated. It really helps with keeping the channel running. So I really appreciate those that are helping out. Thank you very much. So next video will be hopefully in the next few days and hopefully all of this will be working. Hope you enjoyed the video. And until next time, thanks for watching.